University tuition at an all-time high, and so is student loan debt. I have about $5,000, $56,000, $20,000, $3,000, $42,000. Arizona's Attorney General says enough is enough. And I said to myself, wait a minute, a rocket ship takes off that way, tuition costs shouldn't take off that way. But it's not that easy. None of this has been anything that's happened just overnight. A lawsuit demanding a change. This is Arizona Week. Hello and thanks for joining us. The Arizona Board of Regents is facing a lawsuit over the increase in tuition at the state's universities. Attorney General Mark Burnovich filed the suit late last week claiming the high costs violate the state constitution. Here's a look at some of the numbers. In 2004-2005, in-state tuition for Arizona residents hovered around $4,000. Fast forward to 2017, in-state tuition and fees is about $12,000. That's for full-time students. It's about a 300% increase. In Arizona, there are about 171,000 students enrolled at the three universities. The Arizona Board of Regents said last fiscal year, 92% of the student body relied on some form of financial aid. Arizona's university system provided more than $620 million in aid back in 2016, and that number is expected to grow by $81 million over the next two years. It's estimated upon graduating, the average college student will have about $35,000 in debt. You're about to hear firsthand from students, a piece produced by UA Plus, a student-run production here at Arizona Public Media. My name is Daniel Geffrey. My name is Michael Miller. My name is Aaron Panovia. My name is James Skinner. My name is Jordan Smith. I'm majoring in English. I'm a neuroscience graduate student. I'm a dual major in pre-business and mathematics. I am a pre-business major. I'm a freshman majoring in pre-business. I have about $5,000, $56,000, $20,000, $3,000, $42,000 in student loan debt. As college tuition in Arizona keeps rising, debt from student loans isn't pumping its brakes anytime soon. With years and years of debt to consider, the value of a higher education isn't as black and white as it once was. Where did you go to college? Is it a public school? Is it a private school? Um, did you take advantage of a community college first? Where you go to school and what you end up doing when you come out is instrumental in determining your ability, one, to repay the loan, and two, was it worth what you actually paid? Bankruptcy attorney Matthew Foley has been settling debt for the last decade and estimates about 70% of his clients battled directly with student loans, making paying back their loans a challenge. I've already started paying some student loans, and it'll take me about um, eight to 10 years to pay them back. Federal student loans are dangerous because it's not driven off of your capacity to repay the loan. I think that it's too easy to get bad loans from private companies because I've had bad experiences taking out loans that I've had to cancel immediately. And even in the 12 days that I've taken out a loan, the interest rate, had already shot up and I owed so much more money just for a loan that I had for less than a month. And students know little about the loans that they take year after year. I had almost no information about student loans prior to me taking them out. Um, I know it's about 7% like seven in interest rate and then I have, it, I start paying it back after I graduate. And I have, I think it's five or to six years after I graduate, I can pay it off around there. It might be a little longer. For the two-thirds of college graduates that incur debt, their starting salary may not fit the bill. In the criminal justice field, it is very low. It's about twenty-five to 30000 I'm of the opinion that college is tough. You're making tremendous sacrifices to pass up the opportunity to make a living or taking a full-time job. And at the same time, you're passing up the opportunity to make money, you're actually incurring debt. One way of thinking about this. But even with these sacrifices, students see the worth in a higher education. In the long run, you really can't put a price on education. I think that the best investment is in yourself. To the extent that higher education allows you to better yourself and you're a better person for it, it is priceless. However, it's hard to say it's priceless when you can't keep your lights on, when you can't put food on the table, because the priceless education comes with a hefty tuition bill every month.
Arizona Attorney General Mark Burnovich said he filed the lawsuit because it was time to call attention to the cost of tuition. He says it's risen to a figure that violates the state constitution. Mark, thanks so much for your time. You've been in office for about two and a half years now. Why file this lawsuit against the regents now? Well, it's, it's kind of a long answer, but, you know, as the attorney general, I, I've always said from day one that I'm the people's lawyer. And if you look at the things that we've done in this office, whether it's successfully prosecuting the first terrorism cases with the FBI and state court or going after, you know, drug manufacturers like incest for what they're doing with, with opioids in our communities and our system, uh, going after Theranos, we've done a lot of stuff. So we've been really, really busy. Um, and one of the things that we were involved in was a lawsuit that we inherited um, involving in-state tuition and whether folks that were in DACA status were entitled to in-state tuition or not. You may remember that Proposition 300 was passed and Arizona voters by nearly 70% said they didn't want f people that did not have legal status to get in-state tuition. We recently won that case at the Arizona Court of Appeals. So you have a state law, a Court of Appeals decision. And after that decision, the Board of Regents affirmatively voted to continue their policy that was contrary to state law and provide that tuition. So we had to make a decision of how we were gonna move forward. And I kept hearing the regents and the university presidents talk about the importance of making education accessible to everyone and how the framers of our constitution wanted everyone to be educated. And I thought to myself, Yes, that's correct. I know that. And in fact, if you read our Constitution, it says that education, public instruction, or universities is supposed to be nearly as free as possible. So my question became, well, wait a minute. Why are they just focused on this group of about 300 students? Why aren't we asking a bigger and broader question regarding tuition for all Arizonans? Why is it that in-state tuition in this state has skyrocketed? And if you look at, and when we started looking at this issue, I started seeing the, the charts and the, and the graphs from about 2002, 2003, that academic year through this year, it's been almost like a straight line. And I said to myself, wait a minute, a rocket ship takes off that way, tuition costs shouldn't take off that way. And as a, as, as a parent, the two kids in high school now, when I started looking at what the ASU cost me when I was at Arizona State, versus what it costs now, I was absolutely shocked. When I was at uh, ASU in the late 80s, it was about 625 bucks a semester. Now, it's, it's more than $10,000 a year. So education is becoming, um, the spending is becoming out of control. Um, it's not consistent with the constitutional mandate. So we decided the time was right to file a lawsuit. No one else is asking these questions. As the Attorney General, I'm here to uphold the law and the Constitution says nearly as free as possible. So I think it's incumbent on the Regents and the University Presidents to justify why tuition has skyrocketed. Is there a dollar amount that you think is more fair that's maybe not $600, maybe not $2,000, but somewhere before eleven dollars or $12,000 a year? I'm not a policymaker, and, and, and I don't pretend to know the exact amount, but this is one of the things that is troubling to us and to me. First of all, the formula the regents use to come up with tuition here in Arizona, there's three primary factors. One, they look at what peer institutions, like for example, what they're charging at the University of Michigan or Wisconsin or Alabama. Two, they look at the availability of, of financial aid, including loans. And three, they look at the average median income. What's missing from that formula? What's missing is, is it designed to be nearly as free as possible? Are taxpayers getting the most bang for their buck? So what this lawsuit is designed to do is not to say tuition should be X amount or there shouldn't be these kind of fees, but it's to say to the universities and to the regents, how do you justify those skyrocketing costs? Why do you have this formula that focuses on these factors instead of focusing on making education nearly as free as possible? So what I want to do is go back to those first principles and get the universities to justify their costs, to explain to us, to explain to every, every Arizona taxpayer why tuition is so much and how do they come up with those actual costs. Um, the regents have come out swinging and said that your lawsuit doesn't quite offer a solution. What is your response to that? Well, the, yeah, the regions have come out swinging, and, uh, and I guess in some ways I should have expected it because, you know, we're kind of poking our finger at a sacred cow. And for the last 15 years, no one here in Arizona has questioned the policies of the universities and the regents. And um, I guess I've had 
the audacity to do so. And uh, I guess I guess when you're the person that pokes the bear, you know they're going to try to bite. And um, you know, but I but I'm ready for it. We're ready for it. I think we have the facts on our side. We have the law on our side. And once again, I am not a policymaker. It's not up to me as the state's chief law enforcement officer to do the job for the Board of Regents. These are questions they should have been asking themselves. But you know, off the top of our well, my head, I've said, well, wait a minute, you look at other states, they look at peer universities for tuition costs. Well, why is it that states like Wisconsin have 13 state universities, only two of them are research universities, and we only have three overall, and even Wisconsin even has less population. They have 58 community colleges. Are, are the regents or are the universities doing anything to maybe allow, especially in rural Arizona, the community colleges colleges to offer four-year degrees. What are they doing with all the fees? Why does it cost more to attend Arizona State University online than it does if you actually physically are in the classroom? So there, there's a lot of questions I think that need to be answered and you know I don't think you can figure out what the amount of tuition should be until you know the costs and you know the answers to some of those questions and ultimately once again I think it's incumbent on the regents to change the formula. The formula should be focus primarily on going back to those first principles of making education nearly as free as possible. And from there you can move forward. If you want to have a Cadillac or a Porsche of universities, that can be part of the menu. But at some point, you have to provide a vehicle for everyday hard work in Arizonans to be able to afford college for themselves or their kids. The lawsuit caught the Arizona Board of Regents by surprise. Here's President Eileen Klein. Certainly the phenomenon across America has, has been for increased tuition and largely it's because we've seen a really a disinvestment in public higher education across the country and Arizona was hit very hard by the recession so many of the tuition increases have been a result of trying to make sure that universities have the operating revenue they need but it's important to remember that most of our tuition increases have been coupled by state aid and that's why we're able to keep tuition affordable. The recession, one of the factors, but are there other things, perhaps inflation, that have contributed to this? Well, there's been some inflation. Our Arizona public universities are very fortunate. They're able to attract a lot of students. And so we've been able to grow the university system to accommodate all of the students, but also to be able to grow in terms of the quality and in terms of the educational offerings we have. All of those things are positive. All of those things take resources. And we've made the case time and again that yes, we know families need to pay their fair share, all students need to pay their fair share, but we're concerned that the scale has kept tipped too far on the side of making students pay. And we need the state to do more. We need everybody to be able to do more, including the use of private sector dollars, so that we can keep tuition costs affordable for all students. It's interesting though, because as tuition has increased, so have enrollment numbers. What do you attribute that to? Well, first and foremost, during the recession, everybody realized that they needed to get themselves reskilled and better equipped for the new economy that we've clearly seen after the recession. And that's great. We want more people in Arizona to be educated, and we absolutely have to have more people in Arizona educated. We know that two thirds of the jobs require post secondary education, and so college is still one of the surest paths to making sure that people have a lifetime of opportunity. So people wisely wanted to retool themselves to get ready for the new economy that was emerging after the Great Recession. But we also attribute the growth to the fact that we have high quality offerings that still overall across the landscape are affordable. And while it's not, the price is not as low as we want it to be for all students without a doubt, and we need the state support to make it more affordable all the way around. We're pleased that we're able to attract more students here. And in fact, more students coming from out of state has been what has allowed us to keep the average prices paid by Arizona students much lower than they otherwise would be. It seems that in the days following the lawsuit, there has been a lot of finger pointing. Who really manages the purse strings? The regents, the legislature? Well, certainly there's a role for everybody to play. And all of the funding for public higher education comes from a number of sources. The federal government's involved, the state government's involved, tuition's involved, of course families are involved, and then there are private sector donors. So what we're trying to establish is the right mix among all those players. The regents clearly have the authority, the courts acknowledge the authority that the regents have to set tuition, but they do that with, by using a number of factors. 
and we operate within the law and the constitutional mandate to make sure that that tuition remains as nearly free as possible. What we need, though, to make sure that the system's sustainable and that future generations of Arizonans can get into college and succeed is to have more support from the state. We need a portable state-based financial aid system, and we can't just try to operate the universities off of a combination of tuition and institutional financial aid. We didn't just get here overnight. This has been ongoing for several years now. What's going on behind the headlines? What ought people know as this continues to make its way through the court system? You are so right that none of this has been anything that's happened just overnight or just recently. This has been a long-term trend, and now that tuition prices have come to the forefront, I think it creates an opportunity for us to think very differently about higher education in Arizona. We now have set statewide goals. We know what we want the system to do. We know we've got to get hundreds of thousands of people better educated than they are today, some with college degrees and many with technical training at our community colleges. And we need a wholesale rethink on how we're supporting Arizonans in getting access to the education after high school that they need. That's what's really going on here. President Clyde, what can we expect next? Well, certainly in the coming weeks and months, the Board of Regents is going to be very closely watching what happens with Congress around our deferred action students, our DACA students. We want to be sure that students get the certainty they need from the federal government. We've called on President Trump. We will be calling on our congressional leaders to do everything they can to give those students certainty. For those students in particular, that legal authorization to be in the United States and to be recognized is critically important to their ability to continue with their education. We know we have a case before the Supreme Court around the DACA issue, and we want to make sure that those students have their future secured as bona fide Americans. That's how they see themselves, and we need Congress to give them a legal certainty that recognizes their desire to study and live and work and contribute as Americans. So that's, that's clearly what's coming up ahead. We have this challenge from the Attorney General's office. We don't want to see ourselves get spooled up in a lawsuit over how tuition gets set. We need to get to the table and figure out how we're going to make education work for all of Arizona. So we're preparing our legislative budget requests, and we're going to be keeping a close eye on what happens in Congress. And all the way around, it's just an exciting time, I think. Despite the challenges, there's an exciting opportunity before us to really chart a new course for higher education in Arizona. For years, regions have wrestled with setting the cost for university tuition. Two years ago, I interviewed Dennis DeConcini, former senator, retired lawyer, and member of the Arizona Board of Regents for eight years. Here's a look back at what he said then about the controversy surrounding the cost of a college education. It is outrageous, and particularly when it doesn't have to be that way if we had the courage of our political leaders. If you're a blue-collar family, you know, you had to pay $11,000 plus dollars a year for your college tuition. And even if you have a job, you're not going to make much more than that as a student. Now, if you get parents that can help you or relatives, fine. And the federal programs are tremendous, the Pell Grants and other ones, and relied on it immensely. But you have to pay a lot of those back. Deacon Cini says for years, the Arizona Board of Regents has wrestled with the idea of taking legal action. There's some reluctance, always has been, on the Board of Regents for the state agency to be suing the Arizona government and, in essence, the legislature uh, and the governor for not following the Constitution. Though the price of a college education may have risen, the figures haven't impacted enrollment. As a matter of fact, there are 49,000 more students enrolled in universities since 2008 when the recession began. And there are supports in place, among them Earn to Learn. Here's Kate Hoffman. It encouraged the participants to establish a savings account and systematically save towards a savings goal. And in the case of Earn to Learn, that savings goal is included in going to one of our three state universities. Okay, right? so let's say I'm a college freshman. How does this work? Well, I'm gonna actually backtrack just a little bit. And let's say you're in high school, right? And you're on track to potentially be considering going on to higher education. Um, we are in the high schools all over the state. We're also in the community colleges all over the state because this is not only open to traditional students, it's open to community college transfer students. And we uh, share the story of Earn to Learn with the students in, in the high schools who are thinking about going on to school. And, and we set the stage for the students to enter the program at high school. So that savings period actually starts before they even walk on campus as a freshman.
These students are saving money on their own? Um, these students have to have earned income in order to participate in the program. So we actually go through a process of income qualifying the students and their families to make sure that they're eligible to participate in Earn to Learn. Okay, then they get onto campus, and how does their life change? Well, I will tell you, Earn to Learn is um, a financial capability scholarship program. So Earn to Learn is really a position to help those students offset the cost of attendance while they are here on campus. And uh, the way that the program works is it's a $500 savings goal. And as long as the students are successfully completing all of the program requirements, which include the personal finance training and the coaching piece that I mentioned, um, they're positioned to get $8 for every dollar they save in that account. So it's an 800% return on their college savings account. That translates into $45 hundred dollars in additional grant aid that goes towards helping them to offset the cost of attendance. Where does Earn to Learn get its funding? It's a, a combination of institutional aid, which is money that's already earmarked to support low-income students combined one-to-one -one with these federal funds, and that's ultimately where that four thousand dollars is derived from. And the one thing that I would like to add is this program isn't just about access to the universities, so we're not just recruiting the students to come here. Um, the intention of the universities is to support these students all the way through to graduation. So uh, predicated on continued successful pursuit of funding to support the expansion of this project, um, the students can renew the scholarship not only their freshman year but their sophomore year, their junior year, their senior year, and we have a really large percentage of these students pursuing STEM degrees, so so many of them are maybe even here a fifth year. So I want to be clear that you put money in an account and that's how you get started. That's right. Okay. That's right. We have, um, Earn to Learn has partner financial institutions, so we work with Vantage West Credit Union, Hughes Federal Credit Union, Alliance Bank of Arizona, and Mutual of Omaha, and we work with those financial institution partners and they house the accounts on behalf of the students that are participating in the program. And then Earn to Learn actually synchronizes um, the savings activity of the students every 24 hours with our financial institution partners because this program is really all about building a consistent savings behavior, and right, the, or a consistent savings pattern. And the goal is that you want them to graduate with minimal debt. That's right. That's right. And so I, just to talk a little bit about the success metrics of the program, it launched in January of 2013 uh, right here in Arizona. And uh, in that very first year, we recruited 70 students to participate in the program. It's now grown to over 1,500 students um, actively participating in the program. Uh, we're entering our fifth year of being up and running, right, or up and recruiting students. And um, so we now have had over 80 students successfully graduate from the program, and we're pulling that preliminary student loan debt data, and these students are either borrowing zero or very, very close to zero. And really, that's a game changer for a lot of these students to be able to not only make it to the finish line, get the degree, but then to be able to graduate um, and not be burdened with a lot of student loan debt. So we couldn't be more proud of that fact. I have been approached by so many students and families who have heard about the Earn to Learn program and literally told us this was the catalyst that made them even think it was possible to be able to go to school. From scholarships to mentorship, student support spans the state. Here's Rich Nickel from College Success Arizona. College Success Arizona's mission is really pretty simple. Um, we were created uh, almost 12 years ago to help students uh, attain at higher rates and actually help the state of Arizona uh, develop more talent, um, get more students into the pipeline, and actually successful uh, in earning degrees or certificates um, that are low income, uh, first generation, or, or minority students. I think what we realized was is that those are the students that really are not participating at rates that are acceptable for us, especially as we start to think about chasing some of the goals that we have as a state, uh, some of those goals achieved uh, uh, that are tied up in Achieve 60 Arizona and uh, the progress meter and other goals. Some of the services that we offer students are a scholarship program that's aimed at low-income Arizonans attending Arizona institutions. Also a very intensive set of mentoring services uh, that accompany those. Aside from that, we also help lead on some policy initiatives around the state. Uh, the aforementioned Achieve 60 AZ is one of those. And we have the Arizona College Access Network as part of our umbrella.
over the last few years, we've really ramped up our policy side of the house. Um, we really want to be the voice of higher education attainment in the state. And uh, in pursuit of that, we've focused on explaining through reports, data-based information, and really a lot of evidence-based information why it's so important for Arizona to care more about students attaining degrees and certificates at higher rates. So you're essentially getting a scholarship dollars to provide to these students who may not be able to afford it uh, without your program. Where's the funding for you coming from? Is it are private donors? So while we certainly have scholarships, uh, right now we have, um, I think this year we gave about a million dollars in scholarships. Um, that's just one part of our program. We are privately funded on the scholarship side. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that we've realized over the last several years is as much as we would like to, we can't really scholarship our way out of the situation that we're in in Arizona. Um, providing scholarships to low-income students is terrific. It's something we're very, very proud of. And we get to hear their stories every day, which are incredibly inspirational. But we also know if we really want to change what's going on in Arizona around education, we have to be more systemic about that. How many students have you helped along the way now? Well, I think that we're up to about um, $16.5 million that we've provided to about, mm, I think, about 1,200 students over the last 12 years. So uh, the numbers are starting to, uh, to rise, and uh, you know, we're graduating uh, 100 or more students each year now. Is it uh, fair to say, I mean, programs like yours are becoming more popular because financially it's not the most manageable thing to do for a student let alone a first-generation student, to be able to, to figure out how to pay for school. I think you're right. Um, I, I think programs like ours are becoming more popular. Um, but unfortunately, uh, scholarship dollars have a really hard time keeping up with the increases in tuition. And when you're talking about low-income and first-generation college attendees, it's even worse uh, because we know that here in this state that if you're a smart, low-income student, and you go to one of our universities, for instance, and with our help and, and a Pell Grant and others' help, you know, you can, you can probably scrape together enough money to gain access to that university. But what we're finding out is, you know, let's say you're a single mother in um, Maricopa, you have a terrific daughter who's very smart and wants to go to a university. Sometimes the information gap about the processes you actually need to take to get there and what your choices actually are are really just as daunting as the financial side of that. So we have um, you know, really kind of a double whammy of problems when it comes to really gaining support for those students that we care about most. Late this week, Governor Doug Ducey issued a statement saying Arizona's three universities are in compliance with constitutional requirements to keep instruction as nearly free as possible. And that's our program. Thanks so much for joining us.